We now have a talk by Dr. Huda Nasser, who is a senior computer scientist at Relational AI, our gold sponsor. We won't take live questions for this talk, and the audience may ask Dr. Nasser questions later on Discord in the Relational AI channel. We have 10 minutes budgeted for this talk. Over to you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me see if you can see my slides. Uh, Yes, we Does can see your slides. Awesome, cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation by Relational AI, who is a sponsor for this uh, Julia Khan uh, 2021. Uh, my name is Huda Nassar, and I joined Relational AI just a little less than a year ago. Um, just a random fun fact, for the very first time I was introduced to Relational AI was actually at Julia Khan uh, 2018, exactly three years ago. Uh, so it's kind of like a full circle coming together to come back to Julia Khan and talk about Relational AI here so I'm really excited for that. Uh, for this presentation, I really hope to answer two major points, uh, what we do at Relational AI and how we use Julia or how does Julia fit in our system. But before I do that, let me introduce Relational AI just as a one plain statement. Uh, Relational AI is the next generation database platform for new AI-driven uh, data intensive workloads based on uh, relational knowledge graphs and our code bases in Julia. Now, obviously there's a lot to unpack here. And if you wanna unpack more, come talk to us in the Discord channel. Uh, but if you know me, you know I will choose to unpack two major things, uh, graphs and Julia. Uh, so with that, let's start with unpacking the first uh, item, knowledge graphs. So just like the classic definition of a knowledge graph, it is a directed labeled graph in which labels have a well-defined meaning. Uh, so before I introduce a toy example of a knowledge graph, let me introduce this diagram, which is hopefully familiar to a lot of the people in the Julia community. It's uh, it's kind of a schematic diagram of something of a certain world modeling a certain world. Uh, now you can see software packages. A software package can be written in a language. Julia, a company can use a language. Julia and a company can uh, build a, a modeling language like we do actually at Relational AI. We're building our own uh, modeling language. Now this model, uh, we actually call it a schema. And from this a schema, you can think of a knowledge graph that kind of follows this uh, schema or like builds on it. So let me actually zoom a little into this uh, toy example of a knowledge graph. Uh, I chose here some like uh, examples that actually fit in the wider uh, Julia ecosystem. You can see that certain packages are written in uh, Julia, certain companies use Julia and uh, Relational AI uh, builds uh, our modeling language RHEL, which is also uh, built with Julia. Now, the key thing to note here is that such a type of data or such a knowledge graph is actually very easily representable in our uh, system because we basically treat everything in our system as uh, relations. So such type of data is inherently natural to be represented in our system and for us to run any type of uh, computation on it. Now, you might look at this uh, knowledge graph and think maybe this is a little kind of uh, abstract. Does this actually appear in real life and do we actually see it in real life? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, you probably see knowledge graphs or knowledge graphs appear in your life without even knowing it uh, more frequently than you think. I'll, I show here just a simple example of when you uh, search a search query on uh, Google and you get this uh, panel on the uh, right hand side, which is called the knowledge panel. For instance, here I search for Julia. Um, you actually get information that is not just from one source. So at the very top of this panel, there's actually information from Wikipedia. And the very bottom, there's information about books uh, to choose uh, to read about Julia and relevant things people also look for. Uh, but these didn't, if you go to the Wikipedia page, these aren't all on the Wikipedia page. So what Google did here is that it basically collected information from all over uh, the web, different, different websites, possibly data that it already has using its knowledge graphs search capability to come up with this uh, kind of condensed summary of your result. Now, obviously, other companies do that. Siri, um, um, Alexa, a lot of these uh, personal assistants actually do these uh, kind of collection or collecting from different resources. Now, the question is, what if you're a company that has this type of, uh, you're a retail store, let's say, and you have this uh, different uh, information from different um, resources uh, and you want to query this type of uh, data and come up with something related or similar to uh, what uh, Google was capable to do here. So what we produce is this um, 
we call it a knowledge graph management system. And we already work with clients who uh, have problems like fraud detection, search and recommendation. They come from different uh, areas like uh, retail or telecommunication studies and kind of different uh, applications, but they all require this type of knowledge graph uh, type of uh, management. And also actually, if you're in academia and you also have a lot of these uh, types of data and you also want to run, be able to run a knowledge graph management system on your data, this is exactly what we try to offer to anyone who has uh, this type of unstructured data that exists in, in multiple uh, places. Uh, so by now, I really hope that uh, I helped you answer two major things. First of all, uh, uh, what a knowledge graph. I hope you can explain what a knowledge graph is by now. And I hope that you realize what the key product that relational AI uh, is producing. And for now, I want to switch to the Julia part of this talk. Uh, but before I do that, let me kind of give... Um, one major statement that I really love about RHEL, our modeling language that we built. Uh, in RHEL, what you need to specify is uh, w whenever you, uh, you are looking for something, uh, you only need to specify what you need and not how. Just in the same way I just created Julia language on uh, Google, I want to be able to query something, put it, and just not worry about how it's going to be computed. Uh, what happens in the background is that our semantic optimizer will take care of the how. Our semantic optimizer will take care um, of, of the algorithm to figure out the solution for you. Um, and because this seems a little kind of like uh, there's a very smart component that's figuring things out for you, I think for me when I realized that there was a very uh, kind of natural parallel in my head when I thought about it, which is the Julia compiler. So let me actually take a quick detour and go back to a uh, very kind of toy example uh, type of Julia code that you can run. If I run here like this dummy function, my add 10 of x, which is adding 10 to a, a certain value, and I run it in Julia and I go through the compiler kind of um, generally uh, code throughout every uh, step. And I look at certain intermediate uh, steps and I find actually here there was a specific add function that was used on an N64 that was added with 10. Uh, now, if I actually uh, ran this with my add 10 of a 2.0, the values here would have been different. This would have been a 10.0, this would have been an F add. So what happened is that as a user, you didn't have to specify which addition you did. You just wanted to do addition. And the compiler was very smart uh, to specialize on the type that you wanted. Similar thing actually happens in um, RHEL in the sense that we actually are smart in deciding the algorithm to actually run on your data rather than uh, in, in the contrast in the, the compiler scenario. So here I'm actually going to show a specific example to kind of make the point. This is real rel code, totally runnable in, in our system already right now. And I'll explain the syntax very briefly, even though I'm sure there will be some caveat that I won't get to. But basically, this R here has these values 1 through 9, and S has these values 1 through 90. And the goal is to compute actually the summation of every pairwise multiplication of these elements R and S. And um, I guess one common thing to think about is basically you're computing the outer product of if you want to treat these as two vectors, even though we don't uh, treat them as vectors, but that's an easy way to think about what we're trying to compute here. Basically, the summation of all of these elements. Now, if you actually run this code in RHEL and you generate an intermediate um, kind of representation of the code, you will see this. It looks like gibberish to you, most likely. Uh, so I want you to actually just focus on these three uh, lines. Uh, there's a summation here, there's a summation here, and there's a multiplication here. So what happened is that I asked for the summation of this pairwise multiplication, but our semantic optimizer was able to figure out that you don't actually need to compute every pairwise multiplication and then sum them. You can only just create the addition on R and the addition on S and then take the multiplication. And this is actually the most optimal algorithm of N versus O of N squared, and you got the result in a faster algorithm. Um, now, how does this even work and how does how do we bring back Julia to the picture? Now, the major thing is that the semantic optimizer was able to figure out the smart algorithm to figure out your query here. Uh, but then how does this code run? How does this generate uh, move into runnable code? Well, actually, we make use of Julia, one, one amazing Julia feature, which is meta programming. And for that, I'm also going to make a quick detour to kind of uh, pitch what uh, meta programming means in this um, or in, in general, I would say. Uh, basically, metaprogramming is this idea that we generate code or we write code that will generate code. So for instance, here, when I'm looping over these uh, two symbols, two and three, I'm generating basically two functions, my gift function two and my gift function three. So after I run this code, I now have two functions, my gift function two and my gift function three. It's just, it's generated code within the system. And that's exactly um, 
one process in our uh, pipeline where we generate Julia code. And then basically Julia takes care of the rest. Our rel code essentially becomes translated into machine code because the last step is Julia, uh, runnable Julia code. So we actually run the query here. The query optimizer takes care of coming up with the best algorithm. Uh, code generation happens. Uh, something, kind of, this is not exactly it, but something similar to this happens where you compute the sum sum and then return the, um, oh, this should have been multiplication. But anyway, you return the results um, afterwards. Uh, and with that, I, that's the wrap up of the Julia part. I hope that uh, you know by now what's the key enabling component of our uh, pipeline, which is uh, the semantic optimizer uh, that I talked about and how Julia fits in our pipeline, which is basically we generate, uh, we use generated Julia code and then uh, a Julia code gets actually run. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna go into the details of this slide, but I'm just gonna pitch it really quickly. Uh, Julia solves the two language problem. Our system actually solves multiple two system problems. The first one is the model versus implementation in um, running our system, basically the model is the implementation when you write rel code, uh, that's already your model. Uh, we Another amazing feature we have is analysis inside uh, the database. Traditionally, you if you wanted to run machine learning on your data, you would have to download data from your database, run machine learning, and then compute the result. For us, running machine learning is just as simple as running a query, just like the one I showed you earlier, like the summation or something like that. So machine learning is inside the database. And then finally, uh, data storage uh, and retrieval Retrieval versus application logic, these have traditionally been separated, but for us, application logic can be written in uh, RHEL, and uh, we can talk more about this slide offline if you are interested. And finally, uh, you can come talk to us. There's multiple of us on the Relational AI uh, uh, Discord channel. Come chat with us. We're always recruiting, so come join us. It's an amazing company. I love working here, uh, and we love Julia so much, so uh, there's already a job posting on the jobs channel on Discord, so be sure to check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. We would like to thank Relational AI once more for being our goal sponsor. Do visit their Discord channel if you have questions and check out the jobs they have listed on the jobs board.